America, once the most powerful nation on the globe, reduced to tribals fighting over scraps of food, a wasteland devoid of life. There were many who tried to return the world to what it once was. Few had the resolve, and even fewer had the power. And so many of them, in the end, lost the wasteland. Perhaps the most tragic story of failure was that of the Enclave, warriors from a bygone era, still swearing allegiance to the Old World flag. They tried to bring back their America, the perfect America, yet time after time they failed. First in the Appalachian Mountains, then later off the Californian coast, and finally the old capital, DC. That appears to be where the Enclave met its end. But what if the story didn't end like that? What if the Enclave won in Fallout 3? The setup for this change in the timeline will be when the Lone Wanderer is captured and tells Colonel Autumn the Purifier Code. Colonel Autumn subsequently executes the Lone Wanderer after receiving confirmation of the code working. Now having everything he needs, Autumn does what he should have done at the beginning, and orders the Bradley Hercules to fire on the Citadel. This is where the story begins in January of 2278. With Project Purity now operational, Colonel Autumn orders that the facility be expanded into a fully operational military base and the surrounding area be cleared and prepared for farming. The Enclave also sends recovery teams to the ruins of the Pentagon to recover all important materials. President Eden attempts to persuade Colonel Autumn to make use of the modified FEV to cleanse the population, but Autumn once again refuses. Within a month, all valuable technology and research is extracted from the rubble of the Pentagon and transported to Adams Air Force Base. Although it was the headquarters of the Brotherhood of Steel, it proved to hold very little value. Apart from the basic power armor and laser weapons, the only useful material within were a few schematics of weapon prototypes and a large assault robot. However, that was damaged in the bombardment. In March, the initial structure of the water purifier base, now renamed Fort Jefferson, is complete, with basic facilities, a small bottling plant, and chain fences around the base complete. While advanced facilities and defenses will take longer to construct, Nonetheless, the Enclave can now start distributing the Aqua Pura. The Enclave sets their eyes on the larger communities of Megaton and Rivet City to deal with first. The Enclave offers them clean water and protection if they submit to Enclave rule. The communities are initially resistant, but once the Enclave starts setting up defenses, leading to reduced radar and mutant attacks, the opinion changes in favor of the Enclave. The deal is sealed upon the Enclave removing the nuclear bomb in Megaton and providing the Rivet City security force with the Brotherhood equipment. Upon agreement of being annexed, the Enclave retrieves the fighter jets still lying on the deck of Rivet City and adds them to their reserve at Adams. The Enclave then begins registering the people of Megaton and Rivet City as American citizens. With the arrangement now made and the people of the communities now citizens, the Enclave begins transporting water. Rivet City is easy due to its close proximity with Fort Jefferson, but Megaton is a challenge. The problem is solved by airdropping supplies from Vertibirds to Megaton. The Enclave also implements a tax on its new citizens, although without a linked economy established, the new citizens can't directly pay it. The options presented by the Enclave are for the citizens to trade valuable materials, complete labor for the Enclave, or, as the Enclave is trying to expand their forces, join the Enclave as a full-time job which will pay in new US dollars that can be used to pay the tax. Over the next few months, the Enclave thus begins expanding and setting up new outposts with the influx of recruits, and the laborers are sent to work on reattaching the bow of Rivet City and on the farms at Fort Jefferson. As the spring turns to summer, Enclave ground forces wrestle territory from the raiders and super mutants. With almost the Enclave's full attention on the expansion of territory, the squads of Enclave troops burn, shoot, and cleave their way through the hordes of godless creatures. As the ground forces advance far enough to reach the Washington Monument, they encounter a small number of Brotherhood survivors guarding the monument. The ensuing battle nearly topples the monument, but once the Brotherhood paladins are dealt with, the Enclave disconnects the GNR transmitter. It's likely there's still a Brotherhood presence at the Galaxy News radio station. Coming in contact with more and more mercenaries, Autumn decides to contract them to clear out the hostiles ahead of the Enclave. After a short while, the mercenaries begin refusing to take any more contracts as they're losing too many men to the super mutants and raiders. In response, the Enclave massacres all of them. The Enclave continues marching forward. The reclamation of so many monuments only increases morale and support for the Enclave. Once Enclave forces reach the Lincoln Memorial and discover how it has been desecrated, they execute the slaver scum at the memorial and continue on their fight. Enclave scouts confirm suspicions of a Brotherhood force present at the Galaxy News radio station. However, at the same time, a Brotherhood-type group is spotted occupying an old military base not too far from Megaton. 
Autumn orders that all Enclave forces halt in their advancement and begin preparing for a coordinated assault. There remains multiple Brotherhood survivors at Galaxy News Radio, supported by a number of armed civilians. Even with the numerical advantage, Enclave forces would likely take heavy losses, so Autumn orders an aerial attack followed by a ground attack. The Vertibirds begin their attack, dropping bombs on the unsuspecting rebels. As soon as the bombing concludes, the ground units swarm around the building, still supported by the Vertibirds in the sky, and storm the building, inflicting minimal casualties and executing all traitors. To ensure complete annihilation of resistance, Autumn mobilizes the available forces to then attack the second Brotherhood base. Using the same tactic of bombing the area, then following the ground assault, the rebels are all dealt with. However, the distraction leaves Fort Jefferson lightly guarded. Light enough for someone to sneak in and insert a specific toxin into the purifier, then sneak out undetected. As July comes, a strange sickness appears throughout the population. Almost everyone is affected by the strange sickness. Autumn, having an idea of what is happening, requests that the water be analysed. Unfortunately, his worst fears are confirmed when a modified strain of the FEV is detected in the water. With no other option, Colonel Autumn orders the complete halt of food and water distribution from Fort Jefferson. The engineers at the Purifier estimate it will take around two weeks to clear the water of all toxins. Autumn attempts to contact his men at Raven Rock, but receives no response. He knows what he must do, but he also knows that the consequences will be high. Before word spreads of the lack of food or water, Autumn leads all the remaining healthy soldiers up to Raven Rock. Seeing many of his men dead outside the entrance, Autumn orders the door be breached. But before the soldiers can reach the door, Vertibers deploy from Raven Rock and commence a bombing run on the troops, decimating them. Autumn's accompanying air support immediately engages the hostile birds, and in the chaos, the Enclave soldiers breach Raven Rock. The priority outlined by Autumn is to neutralize the Zaks that had been impersonating the President. Upon entering the complex, Autumn's men are met with hostile Enclave soldiers. It seems Eden has coerced them into siding with him. Luckily, Autumn's soldiers are the only ones with Hellfire armor, being exceptionally effective, leading the charge with their heavy incinerators in the close quarters of the complex. It isn't long before Autumn's forces reach the Zax unit. As Eden begins to give his speech on why he needed to exterminate the unclean people, Autumn puts a bullet through his console, followed by another, followed by three more, and a kick for good measure. Without Eden, the facility shuts down, including the automated defences, leaving Eden's soldiers vastly outmatched. When they inevitably surrender and beg for forgiveness, Autumn only accepts it as he knows that this battle has left the already weakened Enclave severely battered. It's at this point where Autumn starts worrying about the food and water crisis. Without Eden, the facilities at Raven Rock can't produce anything, not only hampering the Enclave's resource production, but their weapon production as well. Autumn assigns his best engineers to get Raven Rock back to operational status without the Zax unit, but until then, and until the water purifier is also once again operational, the Enclave will have an extremely difficult time keeping order. The first step is introducing strict rationing of food and water. This is troublesome, however, as the people infected with the toxin require more rations to flush the toxin out of their system, so the unaffected people, i.e. just small amounts of Enclave soldiers, receive less rations. Overall, the opinion turns greatly against Autumn, especially among the citizens of Rivet City, as their farms become the main source of food for the entire Enclave. At the current food production rate, predictions show that a third of the population will die. The Enclave starts trading with merchants around the area for food, which helps the situation but still isn't enough, so scout teams are sent on recovery missions to find resources in the ruins. The former Brotherhood bases are raided, yet they still produce little gain as they themselves source from the community. The Enclave scout teams have a hard time finding clean food or water still buried in the ruins, but the saving grace comes with the discovery of a community of ghouls living in the Museum of History. The scouting team is cautious about putting down the zombies with their numbers, but a solution presents itself quite quickly. A Mr. Gutsy roaming around cursing about the ghouls. The squad engineer approaches the Mr. Gutsy and attempts to override the current programming by using his army identification and authority to order the Gutsy to attack the ghouls, although Mr. Gutsy responds that his combat inhibitor prevents that. After the engineer disables it, the Mr. Gutsy begins ripping and burning through all of the ghouls in the underworld, eventually killing them all. The food that the underworld had stored up is enough to keep the Enclave out of famine until at least the water purifier is operational again. For his contribution, the Mr. Gutsy is promoted to Sergeant, 
and put on the front lines where he can exterminate as many mutants as he wants. As soon as the purifier is operational, the Enclave begins water distribution again, and quickly starts planting new crops. The Enclave comes out of the famine weakened, but still intact. Slowly they rebuild their strength, preparing once again to begin taking territory, and are presented with the perfect opportunity. After hearing of the reclamation of the Lincoln Memorial, Hannibal Hamlin and his abolitionists at the Temple of the Union make the trek to the memorial and present the head of the statue of Lincoln to the Enclave. Thrilled by the completion of one of their important monuments, the Enclave rewards the abolitionists by stepping up their neutralization of threats in the area and raiding Paradise Falls. For the first time ever, the sight of vertebrates flying overhead becomes a symbol of hope, as the Enclave storms Paradise Falls, freeing the slaves and burning the slavers alive. In the name of President Lincoln, they take the ones that surrendered and execute them with their own bomb collars. Support for the Enclave and the Old America skyrockets. The Enclave had broken the back of slavery in the capital wasteland. As the Enclave forces are ordered to hunt down any stragglers, the Lincoln Memorial becomes a sanctuary for escaped slaves. The morale for the Enclave is at its highest point yet. Although still weakened, Enclave forces once again begin tearing through the wasteland abominations and reclaiming their homeland, although unaware, greatly helped by the deadly effect the infected water had on the creatures. As July becomes August, the Enclave integrates more communities into their empire, gaining more strength and driving the enemies of America further away. It's not long before the people start flocking to the region hearing of its safety and prosperity. Soon after, Raven Rock becomes operational again and the weapon production starts up again, allowing the Enclave to dramatically increase its military force of the influx of new recruits and within three months the entire capital region is liberated. With Vault 87 being destroyed, Fort Bannister cleared of Talon Company leadership and Fort Constantine's silos secured. The Enclave continues to increase its momentum as more and more people join their cause. As the Enclave grows, the scum of the world also attempt to take advantage of the prosperity. But day by day, mile by mile, the Enclave only becomes more unstoppable and uses harsher punishment. Fast forward five years, the expansion of the Enclave drastically slowed as it became clear that the military could not continue to act as the government. General Autumn could not handle the civilian aspect of the Enclave and founded a civilian government that could handle such matters while the military operates with no restrictions. And so it came that America had a president once again. President Hamlin considered the new Lincoln thanks to his key role in the ending of slavery in the capital region and his continued support of the matter. The capital region had turned from a desolate wasteland to a livable and mostly lawful society. A full economy has been largely established, however labour was still a form of taxation payment. This had allowed the Enclave to complete many construction projects, including roadways all around the region and mass housing that was used in part to empty Rivet City as it was repaired and returned to a military asset. The main problem still facing the Enclave and another reason for the halt of the expansion is the lack of weapons. The Enclave begun construction on new industrial sectors including weapons development, but nothing can compare to the Raven Rock manufacturing capabilities. Yet Raven Rock still has a limit to its production, which is being pushed by the current sides of the Enclave's military. The crosshairs of the Enclave now fall on West Virginia. With the mass automation before the war and relatively little damage from the war, it's a prime target for the Enclave's need. But the primary objective is installation CB002 and its satellite facilities. However, like the rest of the US, it's infested with monsters. The Enclave has been preparing to launch an invasion of West Virginia. This is where we return to the story, on the eve of the Enclave's invasion, January 2284. General Autumn is overlooking the air fleets, consisting of a large force of restored fighter jets modified to have ground assault capabilities. They will play a key role in the reclamation of West Virginia, as it's important the Enclave doesn't get bogged down in West Virginia after being dormant for years. Autumn knows that the Enclave needs to keep momentum in this new war if they are to satisfy their own desire for growth. In the early morning, vertebrate rotors buzz all across Appalachia, as strike teams land in hot zones swarming with hostiles. The Enclave forces have a clear directive, to secure or extract valuable resources and information from hot zones and mark enemy clusters for destruction. The first area to be captured is Wade Airport, allowing an easier deployment point for the Air Force. One after one, Enclave forces storm fortified areas and begin to wrestle them out of control of the degenerates of the region, mutants, raiders and robots. 
Westech is one of the first invaded. The soldiers blast their way through the swarms of super mutants, moving into the facility and plundering the research. The soldiers escape the facility and let the air support bomb the place to nothing. With Westech dealt with, the ground forces can move on to the radio array and Emmett Mountain. The mutated freaks prove to be quite a challenge, but still fall under the weight of the coordinated Enclave ground and air attacks, giving the Enclave more territory. The three power stations around the region are marked as the next priority. The Charleston plant was secured with little difficulty from the pests inside. The Monongah power plant is a similar story, infested with mutants, all of them put down quickly. Afterwards, the team there travelled to the Atlas Observatory. Encountering no resistance in their task, only the remains of a long past Brotherhood chapter. The Thunder Mountain power plant, however, while also simple to secure, after closer inspection the plant is too damaged to function. The facility has been ravaged by large vines and the strike teams are ordered to move on to the Robco Research Center. The robots prove more dangerous than the mutated pests of the power plant, but still no match for the strike team. The facility soon comes under Enclave control. Enclave forces begin converging as they move on to the largest target, Watoga. Thanks to the robot sentries, the city has remained mostly intact for all these years. The objective for the majority of the invasion force is to provide a distraction for small teams to infiltrate the city and reprogram the security systems. The strike forces begin assaulting the city. As the robots swarm to defend against the attackers, the infiltration team is airdropped onto the municipal building rooftop. From there, they breach the control room where they disable the robots, and the city falls under Enclave control. As the engineers work on reprogramming the robots, the rest of the invasion force departs to rally with the reinforcements and continue mopping up all of the other threats in the area. While this is happening, special operations teams are securing highly valuable Enclave assets. Under the old White Spring Resort, the first team locates installation CB002. Upon opening the doors, they are met with dead silence and the century-old stale air of a long-gone enclave. Pushing deep into the facility, the team passes dozens of lifeless robots, eventually reaching the control center of the long-dormant AI system. The AI would take time to reboot, but the systems could still be activated and the locations of the other enclave installations could be retrieved. With this information in hand, the other special operations teams head to their objectives. The research stations are cleared and secured, although some of them show alarming data. As the fighting throughout the area rages on, Enclave Command tries to piece together the information, but nothing can be acted on without further information, which is provided once the special operations teams move onto the vaults. Vault 76 is just empty, not destroyed, not full of bodies, just empty. Vault 96 and 94 are in poor condition, but once cleared of the mutants, it's determined the majority of the assets can be recovered. However, it is also discovered that the Gek Vault 94 possessed is the cause of the immense plant growth throughout the area. With this information, Enclave Command orders that the entirety of the Maya, as the locals call it, be firebombed. The missile silos are all searched, but the facilities do not appear to be operational. The last and most secret vault still hasn't been found. The location was known only to the highest level of government before the war, and since then it has essentially been lost. From old records, Enclave Command narrowed its location to a 25 click radius. Save the last vault and everything up north in what's called the Toxic Valley, all of the priority targets have been dealt with, as the invasion forces continue to wade through the mutant infested hellscapes. Wade Airport is transformed into Wade Air Force Base and becomes the headquarters of the Appalachian forces. From here, the Enclave sends soldiers to all of the identified population centers, with the intent of recruiting them. Most of the settlements seeing the power of the Enclave agree to join. The one that refuses is the largest settlement known by the locals as Foundation. However, once the Enclave burns down Huntersville and all of the horrors inside it, Foundation understands the position it's in and reluctantly joins. The Enclave quickly begins recruiting citizens of the settlements to act as security for said settlements, tightening Enclave hold over them. As the days and weeks go by, the Enclave continues to gain power in West Virginia. The robots of Watoga are finally under Enclave control, allowing the almost completely intact city to be populated again. The AI modus in installation CB002 is brought back online, allowing access to the mass production center of the bunker. Modus fills in the capital division of the Enclave on what occurred in Appalachia about the Scorched Plague, its eradication, the Brotherhood, and the aftermath. 
Vault 79 is eventually found and opened to reveal a surviving remnant of the Secret Service still guarding the gold-filled vault, which would explain the gold-based economy in Appalachia. The Enclave is eager to introduce gold to the entirety of their economy, although it takes a significant amount of evidence to convince the Secret Service, or as they refer to themselves, the Sentinels, that the Enclave are the old government. Eventually, the Sentinels accept the Enclave's authority, allowing them control over the gold. As February approaches, the Enclave continues to power through Appalachia, exterminating everything that stands in their way. Day by day, they move closer to the Raider fortresses in the north, driving all their enemies in that direction as they go, hoping the Raiders and mutants will wipe each other out. Through February, this more or less plays out. By March, the Enclave is almost in control of the entirety of Appalachia. Having pushed all of the mutants and raiders into the north, the Enclave begins Operation Torchlight. Jets repeatedly firebomb the northern region, followed by troops massacring the survivors. And so, Appalachia completely falls under the Enclave's control. With the mostly intact industrial assets of the region, the Enclave can continue to produce weapons and supply their own growing population. While the water in Appalachia is mostly radiation free, the Enclave still begins building a second purifier to ensure water purity. General Autumn decides it's time to send the repaired aircraft carrier, now called the USS Hamlin, to reinforce the Chicago outposts while the Enclave builds up strength in the home states. Once the expeditionary force reaches the Great Lakes Naval Station, they are greeted by the personnel on the base and are briefed on the situation. The Chicago Division had control over the city and the surrounding area thanks to an alliance with the Brotherhood force in the city. The expeditionary force sends a team back to DC to inform Autumn of the situation. The expeditionary force could do nothing but assist in the expansion of the Chicago Division until they received new orders. By April, the scout teams had informed Autumn of the status in Chicago. Autumn flies to Chicago to talk with the Chicago Division. Upon meeting with them, he orders that the Brotherhood be integrated into the Enclave or it be destroyed. When the Brotherhood is faced with the proposition of integration into the Enclave, many of the members accept, viewing the Enclave as the evolution of the Brotherhood while the more fanatical members refuse, citing it as heresy to the Brotherhood's beliefs. The Brotherhood loyalists attempt to exile the traitors, but when faced with the Enclave as well, the loyalists are pushed out of Chicago within a month. The Brotherhood loyalists retreat to their bunkers that stretch across the wastes. The Enclave will have a fight ahead of them, but for the moment, the Brotherhood is out of the way. As such, General Autumn orders that the ships at the naval station sail to DC to aid the Enclave in expansion along the coasts. For the next few years, the Enclave continues their expansion by capturing military installations and industrial assets, and inducting the towns and cities into the Enclave to expand their force. Unlike Washington and Chicago, the other states have no significant military force, and the uncoordinated tribals are easily annexed. Although, this comes with the downside of requiring more time to train the tribals for combat. Overall, the armed forces drop in quality. This, and the lack of proper infrastructure that the Enclave can annex, causes them to once again halt their expansion and focus on developing what's inside their walls. After two years of industrial, agricultural, and military development of the weapon and soldier, the Enclave War Machine starts up once again with their upgraded models of the Hellfire and the Mark II. The expertly trained soldiers have no problem clearing the wasteland of the repulsive creatures that have inhabited it. Within mere months, the two Enclave forces manage to reach each other and unite to push the Wasteland back even further, eventually reaching the Brotherhood Bunkers, which begins the Great Expansion War. As the Enclave tries to hunt down the Brotherhood, they find success at first, but soon fall victim to the Brotherhood's extensive use of guerrilla tactics, and attacks on the Enclave's industrial power. The Brotherhood proves a fiercer opponent than initially expected, so General Autumn diverts more resources to the Lightning Program. The war quickly becomes a drain on the Enclave's economy as they expend great amounts of resources on hunting down the Brotherhood which cannot be made back with a gain from the expansion. The entire expansion has just turned into a hunt for the Brotherhood. The Enclave has such little difficulty taking territory that everything in between them and the Brotherhood is just cannon fodder at this point. Eventually though, after months of chasing the Brotherhood across the country, Project Lightning is finished. The Vertibird Mark III is deployed. With superior weapons, maneuverability, and speed that can rival a jet fighter, the Mark III is the ultimate weapon. Using the Mark III's, the Air Force starts striking the Brotherhood faster and harder. Even in places the Brotherhood thought would be safe from the air, they can't escape the Mark III's. They become mythical to the Brotherhood, as they can't even see them before they strike, and they move faster than most thought possible. 
Thanks to the Mark III's and the Enclave's own wising up to the guerrilla tactics of the Brotherhood, the Enclave starts turning the fight in their favour. But still, the Brotherhood seems to always produce more soldiers to fight the Enclave. Eventually, as the Enclave continues to push the Brotherhood further away, they catch on to the Brotherhood's tactics of continually drafting tribals to bulk up their numbers. Not too dissimilar to the Enclave's own tactics, but, well, those tribals are serving their country. Unlike the commie bastards that are fighting for those Brotherhood cultists. As March comes, Autumn grows incredibly tired of losing men and resources to the Brotherhood, and authorizes the launch of Operation Cauterizer. The Enclave begins burning down everything west of the Brotherhood, lighting everything for miles on fire, so much that you could see it from space. By the end of it, the entirety of Kansas has turned black. However cruel, however immoral, the Enclave has succeeded. Apart from much of the Brotherhood being caught in the fire, the fire killed countless numbers of people that the Brotherhood could have used against the Enclave, and miles of fields that could have provided food to the Brotherhood. It was simple for the Enclave to hunt down the few Brotherhood survivors this time. Although it was a certain victory for the Enclave, Autumn couldn't justify it to himself. So when the time comes, and the news of the atrocities the military committed reaches DC, the public and the civilian government call for justice. Although he isn't commanded by either, Autumn chooses to resign, leaving in exile. In the resulting power vacuum, the civilian government uses the opportunity to take control of the military. Without Autumn, morale for the military plummets, and Autumn's replacement, General Lawson, just can't compare to Autumn's skill level. The military loses all sense of purpose, and as the Enclave begins expanding in all directions once again, it turns into a slow, draining war. Compared to just months ago, the Enclave's effectiveness is less than half. They are a mere shadow of their former self. As the Enclave forces trudge on, further up the east coast, they encounter less resistance than originally thought, and many of the tribals are too eager to join up. But the Enclave will accept anyone willing to fight for them. As the Enclave approaches the Commonwealth of Massachusetts, an aura of uneasiness fills the air. Entering the city of Boston, Enclave forces notice a distinct lack of hostiles, even though the scout teams had reported swarms of enemies in the area. The division in Boston soon goes silent. Enclave Command sends in more scouts to investigate, but they too go silent. Eventually, they're spotted approaching the capital. Refusing to respond to command, as they are denied entry, they open fire on the capital. When Command declares the capital is under attack, and contacts the Eastern forces, all are being attacked by their own men. Not too long after many of the troops in the capital turn against their brothers, chaos erupts as no one knows who is on their side. And it seems this sudden, almost robotic change of loyalties is happening all throughout the Enclave. The Enclave forces in DC mount a desperate defense against the traitors, and it seems they are saved when reinforcements arrive. But the reinforcements are yet more of the turncoats. As they are besieged from every direction, the Enclave forces are barely holding together. In one last attempt, the military regroups at Adams Air Force Base to hold the traitors at bay. But the enemy is now receiving help from some other enemy force. It seems all is lost, and once the military receives word that the President and the rest of command have been taken, they have no choice but to retreat. The remaining military forces evacuate, watching as Adams burns behind them. They head to West Virginia hoping to regroup and counterattack. But this hope is squashed when the military finds much of Appalachia in flames. At first they believe Wade Air Force Base is safe, however, once the base is in view, they can see vertebrates attempting to flee get shot down. At the same time, they receive an encrypted message containing coordinates. With no other choice, they follow the message. Upon arrival, the military survivors discover they are at the White Spring Bunker. As they are welcomed in by the AI Modus and the base staff, they soon learn that this is the last safe zone in Appalachia. Many of the soldiers want to know exactly what is going on. So Modus briefs them on the situation. The Congressional Bunker, being the highly secure facility that it is, wasn't prone to the defectors. A number of them did try to take control of the bunker, but were easily neutralized. Upon interrogation, it was determined that the perpetrators were in fact all synthetic replications of Homo sapiens, programmed to act as ordinary soldiers until they are ordered otherwise, wherein they will attempt to execute all Enclave personnel. I predict that these synthetic humans have been infiltrating the Enclave for a minimum of two years, likely posing as simple villagers desiring to join the Enclave. It is also likely the infiltrators disposed of Enclave personnel previously, allowing the replacement of the personnel by synthetic replicants. 
This would explain the enemy's efficiency when seizing control of the Enclave. Given the disappearance of the 47th Infantry Division in the Commonwealth of Massachusetts, and the subsequent attacks shortly after, it can be concluded that, primarily, the enemy base is located within the area, and secondly, that a base so far east would leave the west lighter in hostile infiltration. This assumption falls in line with the installations out west sending no distress signals up until communications were cut. This gives the Enclave a 32.7% chance of success still. This number will increase when my AI system is transported to Point Eagle in Missouri. The soldiers are quite overwhelmed with what they just heard. Many don't believe in the possibility of winning, without a plan and with the leadership gone. Modus is not pleased with this reaction, and responds outlining he does indeed have a plan, and how it is unfortunate that command was captured by the enemy, but gives the soldiers coordinates and states that is where he believes they'll find what they're looking for. So without further delay, the military survivors begin preparing to leave. They take all the supplies they can carry, and despite the risks, Modus is transferred into an experimental data core, leaving the defences of the facility on. The last thing to be lifted out of the facility as the Enclave sets out for Point Eagle is a large container. The soldiers aren't sure what's in it, all they can make out are the words on the side. Lazarus. Upon arrival at Point Eagle, the base staff are skeptical of the arrivals, but Modus makes the situation clear, and everyone is welcomed in and debriefed. The western bases are all still under Enclave control, and they've been holding the enemies at bay, but without command, they're too unorganised and have no proper attack plan. Modus states that he can solve both of these problems, but requests that he be installed into the base's network. Modus orders the military to go to the coordinates he gave. The coordinates don't make any sense though. They're in Kansas, in the Ash Desert. Yet the soldiers have no choice but to follow his orders. Heading to the coordinates, the recon teams discover they point them to an old Brotherhood bunker. In fact, the bunker where the Enclave finished the Brotherhood off. The recon teams enter the bunker, searching it they find absolutely nothing, until they reach the lowest level. A man sits in front of them. As he turns around, the recon team realise it's Autumn. As they all salute him, he merely expresses disappointment at them being here. The soldiers desperately try to get Autumn to come with them, but he still shows no interest in their cause. The soldiers explain to Autumn what has happened to the Enclave. Autumn can't take back what he did, but maybe he can make up for it, and this is his chance. He agrees to return to duty and leaves with the recon team to Point Eagle. With the arrival at Point Eagle, Autumn is reinstated as general and placed in command of the remaining military. The first thing Autumn asks is, is the status of the Navy, yet no one knows, so Autumn orders that they find out. Point Eagle scrambles all the fighters they have to head out to the last known location of the fleet. When approaching the location, the fighters see the sky lit up from aircraft firing at the warships. The fighters move in and begin taking out the hostiles. One by one, the enemy aircraft are blown out of the sky. Once the fight is over, the fighters are hailed and brought onto the carrier. The pilots give the fleet commander Autumn's orders to head west and regroup. Over the next month, the western forces prepare to attack. Day by day, their chances grow higher as they focus their efforts. Although, the enemy does the same. But they aren't nearly prepared enough. The Enclave begins phase one of their plan. The Enclave have determined that their enemies have access to teleportation technology, and that kind of tech requires a signal to anchor the teleportation. The Enclave only needs to gain access to a teleporter, and they have a pretty good idea of where to get one. The President has now declared the Western forces as traitors, so it's safe to assume the new White House the Enclave built in DC has become the headquarters of the enemy in the city. If anywhere has a teleporter, it's there. The city is defended with anti-aircraft batteries and depth charges, so there's few options for infiltration, but the Enclave isn't giving up yet. All of their available resources are being poured into this plan. So, under the cover of darkness, the Enclave launches high-altitude stealth-equipped Mark III's loaded with Sigma soldiers. As the Mark III's pass thousands of miles above DC, Squad Sigma drops into the city undetected. As the soldiers activate their sensors, they detect a teleporter signal in the communications room. The soldiers enter the room and eliminate the hostiles, but one of them gets back up, taking shots at the squad. They return fire, and after a considerable amount of bullets, the enemy falls. The squad once again activates their sensors, only to find the teleporter is contained within one of the bodies. The one full of bullet holes, to be precise. 
The package is secured, but the squad is compromised. So after shooting their way to the roof, they fire the emergency flare, at which point Enclave forces begin high altitude bombing on the anti-aircraft batteries. While the batteries are distracted lighting up the sky, the Stealth Mark III's skyhook the soldiers out of the area as the Enclave returns to base with the package in hand. The specimen returns in less than desirable condition, but Modus is still able to extract crucial data. Modus pinpoints the headquarters of the enemy to a bunker underneath the Cambridge Institute of Technology. Modus also gains other important information from the specimen. This, combined with updated scout reports of the Boston area, become alarming. He alerts General Autumn that they will indeed need Project Lazarus to be completed if the plan is to work. Understanding the requirements, Autumn assigns all available resources to it as the Enclave prepares to attack. He'll just have to hope that it's finished in time. On April 17th, 2290, the remaining Enclave forces launch Operation Fading Sunlight, the best last hope for them. The entirety of the Enclave's remaining military is on the offensive, Dozens of vertebrates swarm the skies of Appalachia, attacking the enemy forces head-on, decimating them and burning down the survivors. But this is only a distraction, as the enemy forces crowd to the front lines, Autumn and Squad Sigma sneak into the missile silo Alpha. The soldiers are confused why exactly they are sneaking into a ruined silo. Autumn simply explains that it isn't. After the silos were discovered, Autumn secretly ordered Modus to repair the silos with his robots. The only functioning one so far is Alpha, but that's all they'll need. As Autumn gets into position at the silo Alpha, he radios Modus and informs him stage 2 of the plan is complete and to begin stage 3. Modus acknowledges and relays the order to the Navy stationed well off the coast of Massachusetts. The city of Boston is protected by anti-aircraft batteries, so the Navy drops Project Lazarus outside the city. As Lazarus activates and the Navy hears the words, Liberty Prime is online! They begin their long-range barrage of the city. Prime's mission is simple. Destroy the anti-aircraft batteries and clear a path for the nuclear missile. One by one, Prime knocks out the batteries, leaving havoc where he treads. Soon, the city is clear of the batteries and the nuke can target the CIT ruins. Prime only has one task left, to break his way into the bunker. The bunker is so far underground that the nuke will not be able to damage it unless a path is opened, and Prime can open it. Once Prime is inside, the enemy will be able to deactivate his electronics, so once Prime's signal is offline, Autumn knows to launch. Prime begins blasting and punching his way down into the earth, but hostiles begin teleporting around him and laying fire into him, slowing him down significantly. Meanwhile, enemy forces over in Appalachia discover that Autumn is in the silo and begin swarming it, so Squad Sigma runs to defend the position. It all depends on Liberty Prime's ability to break through to the bunker. Back in Boston, Enclave vertebrates fly into the area to give Prime air support and eliminate the hostiles, although they are soon recalled because they can't be too close when the nuke launches. As Prime is torn apart by the attackers, he continues the assault on the ground beneath him, carving further and further into the earth. Eventually though, he can't take the damage and his battery begins dying. So with the last of his energy, he puts everything into his eye beam and blasts directly down. As Prime goes lifeless, he falls into the large complex beneath. As Squad Sigma gets pushed further and further back through the silo, Autumn sees Prime's signal fade and launches the nuke. Liberty Prime was finally able to serve his country for the first and last time. But his sacrifice was not in vain. By clearing the way for the Enclave, they were able to destroy the bunker and whatever evil was contained within. For this, he was awarded his own monument back in DC that would inspire future generations for years to come. In the immediate aftermath, many of the synthetic humans became confused about what to do and many straight out short-circuited. The Enclave used this opportunity to take back their country and rid themselves of the synthetic abominations. General Autumn, for his heroism and lifelong service, became quite popular as a leader and was elected president, repeatedly, serving his full five terms. The Enclave was severely weakened by this conflict, but within only nine short years they were back to their full strength. 
Within 12, they had begun expanding once more. Within 16, the entirety of the eastern United States had fallen under the Enclave's banner. The ghost of the old America had risen, and it was time for the armies of the West to feel its wrath. <laughs>